I'm just going to pray for Adam as he, uh, as he ministers the word to us now. And um, yeah, don't be distracted by the, the greenery. I like, I like it. I think we should have a story. What do you think? Father, Father, thank you for Adam. Lord God, thank you for the, the week of annual leave he's just had. Father, thank you that he's come back refreshed. And Father, that you've given him a word to share with us today. May our hearts be open to receive what you have to say. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Oh, I feel like I'm in the set of a kind of jungle movie. Um, <laughs> this is because I reckon that Damien's done this because I like to walk around and I think he's going to try and trip me up this morning. Well, can I add my congratulations to Graham and Sharon, who I can't see where they've gone to. There, there, there you are. Congratulations. And it's great to, to be here and to celebrate the renewing of their wedding vows. And uh, what, to, what do you talk about? on a day like today. What do you speak about? Um, I thought about giving as an option. I could have spoken about giving, but no, no, I didn't think I'd do giving. I thought um, I would talk about love. And all you need is love. And uh, I've set a few challenges to people. I'm gonna mention a few song titles this morning. There's the first one. So if you can get all of them, I don't even know half of them. Um, but they're gonna come up as we go through the sermon this morning. But before we go on to talk about love, I just really wanted to just to, to frame the, the act of marriage. Because the act of marriage isn't the end of this story. It isn't the end of, um, of or it's not the, the destination. Marriage is a stopping point, a waypoint on the journey of life together. And um, you may be sitting there thinking, gosh, Adam's going to talk about marriage. And maybe you're not married. Maybe you're currently not dating and how's this going to apply to you? But because it is this kind of waypoint here, love, and what I'm going to talk about this morning, applies to all of us. You see, if you are dating, if you are not dating, if you are engaged, if you're thinking about dating uh, for the first time, perhaps you're married, we all need to remember that there is a foundation to every relationship. And that foundation to relationship, I believe, is love. And so we need to see the power of love. Whoa. Thank you. Uh, in this morning, that's probably about the only one I'm going to remember now. But I, I, want us, I want us to see how love is the foundation to every relationship, regardless of whether you're married or not, regardless of whether you're thinking about dating, whether you're engaged. How love is so important to everything that we do. And so how do I know that love is the foundation? Well, when Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was. And you've got to bear in mind that the, the Pharisees, the, the Jews of the time, had added so many rules and commandments and instructions to followers, to, to, um, to the Jewish nation at that time, that you know this was a trick question. What was the most, or what is the most important commandment? And he asked it in the following way, and the verses will come up behind us. It's Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. It says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And just before we continue, I'm just going to take my watch off to give you some hope that I may remember what the time is as I'm going this morning. So, here we see Jesus answering the question, what is the most important commandment? And I want us just to see the significance of the word love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love him. So, you know, what is this love? What is this? What does it mean? And I think that we've actually, in, in culture today, we have um, seen the word love hijacked, haven't we? We've seen many words hijacked today by culture. Um, we used to run a uh, youth outreach called The Base on the Kingswood Community, at the Kingswood Community Centre on the Kingswood Estate. And some of the words that I discovered didn't mean what I thought they meant. Sick. When one of the kids went, that was sick. I was like, where? Where? Where is sick? Apparently, that is a good thing. Now, the sick. Wicked is a word that as a, we have um, 
that, that is, just means something completely different. I was watching a program once and I, I had to kind of do a little bit of a double take. Somebody said, that was dope. <laughs> dope? This is on BBC at six o'clock on a Saturday evening. We don't say dope. Then, so words have changed, haven't they? Word, what they mean. And I think the reason that we as, as Christ was, that we as, uh, as human beings struggle with the word love is that we've taken it and we've changed its meaning. We've made, I think we've actually dumbed down the word love. I think we've cheapened the word love. You see, you can love your football team, come on the Spurs. You can, <laughs> thank you. You can, you can love your favorite television program. I think I've even seen adverts for loving cosmetic uh, products and procedures, for loving your new car, for loving your tumble dryer. How can you love a tumble dryer? It does a job, and that's what it needs to do. But we have, we have played down the importance of this word love, and we need to recapture that this morning. We need to recapture what the Bible says about love. And the first thing I want to just quickly address is that first command of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart. That should be the first thing we do. And I don't want to dwell on that, but it can be a stumbling block for many of us because we have to, you know, well, I, I love my wife more than, you know, surely I need to love my kids more. Surely I need to. I promise you that if you love God first with all of your heart, then out of the overflow of that, will become such better relationships with your wife, with your children, with your relatives, with your neighbours. Yeah, Don't let that be a stumbling block. Don't say, well, God is making himself more important. Yes, God is more important because he created the planet. He is our God. That's right. But it won't hurt us to love God first. I met my lovely wife, Ruth. Is she here? I haven't seen her this morning. <laughs> Am I out of byline? Yes, I think I'm right. And so I met her um, some 18 odd years ago, ish, and uh, and I wasn't a Christian at the time. And uh, I would say that I I loved her dearly. She was the only girl I'd ever dated that I actually envisaged marrying. And uh, and we got married. And then I became a Christian. And I. I wrestled with, you know, for a while, what did it mean to love God more than I loved Ruth? But I, I would tell you, I believe in my heart of hearts, I don't think I can tell you the exact time, but when I got that right, when I started to love God first, and then out of the out, out of the out overflow, sorry, of that, loving Ruth, our relationship changed for the better. And so that's the, I just want to cover that bit really quickly this morning, that we, we need to put God first. And uh, when, we look at love, when we look at relationships, there are these foundations, and I to say love is the first one, but within love of that is love of God is the first foundation stone that we need to put, that we need to love God with all our heart first. And if you're not a Christ, or if you don't know Jesus, then carry on listening, because there's going to be a moment later, I believe, where you will see how much God loves you. Actually, I know that there's a moment because I wrote the sermon. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm not pretend. There will be a moment where you will see how much God loved you. And uh, so we've covered that a little bit first. And then Damien helpfully stole my verses this morning in this <laughs> sermon. I should have realised he would use these. But let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to look at verses 4 up to the start and a little bit of verse 8. Because this is what, now we're going to start to put some understanding to this biblical foundation of what love is. What does it mean when the Bible uses the word love? If we're going to love each other well, then I think we should follow biblical standards for loving. We should have that as our foundation. It says the following, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You know, some people say that the Bible is irrelevant. It doesn't help us at all. 
that helps us, doesn't it? Yeah. We have a we have a list of what love is. We have a list of the foundation that our relationship should be built upon, and all of these qualities are important. And um, I'm not going to look at all of them in depth, but I'm going to take a few of them. And uh, this is where Ruth will start to be worried because there's bound to be some reference to our life there. And uh, love is patient. That's the first area that I want us to look at this morning, that love is patient. How do we need, don't, don't we need patience in this world? Don't we need to understand that love doesn't rush things? We live in a society of instant. We live in a society of 24-hour news. Do you know, all the things that are happening now happened 60 years ago. We just didn't report on it every hour on the hour. The, the world, I don't think, has dramatically got any worse. I just think that we know about it a little bit more now. It's out there. Technology has made things instant. We live in a, cha a time of Instagram, Insta-chat, uh, Snapchat, sorry, not Instagram, that's how up with the kids I am. <laughs> Facebook, 24-hour news, this, the sermon the, and everything this morning has been live-streamed. People can see things instantly. And the word wait, the word take your time are bad words. I'm not the most patient man in the world. I think I have used up all my patience by the time I get out of bed. In the morning it's gone. <laughs> And I need to remind myself that we need to be patient. If we're going to build a relationship with people, if we're going to build a relationship in marriage, if we're going to build a relationship in friendship, in dating, then we need to have patience. Boy, my wife needs to have patience with me. I am not an easy person to live with. This will surprise a number of you. But I am not an easy person to live with. I have some interesting quirks. Those of you that work with me at the Hope Centre will have seen some of them. I have the ways I like things done. I like to think that I am the world's tidiest person. Possibly not. But we need to, we need to have patience. Ruth has endless patience with me. I don't need patience with her because, well, she just needs to it. But um, we need to have patience with our kids. We need to have patience with our friends. I think actually as a church, we need to have some patience with the world that we live in. You see, and this isn't, I didn't write this down, but I, I just feel that this is, is something that we need to think about. We, we can be known as Christians for a, a lot of things. We can be called bigots, we can be known for what we don't like. We can be accused of not liking certain sectors of community, certain people. And I think for some Christians that's probably true that they don't like people, but that's what we're called to do. We're called to love, love our neighbor. And so we need to be patient. You know, I didn't come to know Jesus until I was 24, 25. I had had opportunity before that. We need to sometimes have patience with the world that we live in, not agree with it, not enjoy it, not, not, not say what it's doing is right, if it's wrong as in God's standards. But I think sometimes, you know, we try and rush things and so we need to have a little bit of patience. We, we need to remember that God is patient with us. How many times, you know, has God spoken to you and said, don't do that? And how many times have you gone, it's alright God, I'll get away with it this time, I'll do it. How many times, you know, God has to be immeasurably patient with me. I, I have a love of Pepsi Max. I did have a love of a certain type of energy drink as well, which I have managed to stop drinking, which I'm really pleased about. Hallelujah. But I, 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 we were recently away at a conference, and, I, and uh, I said, you know, I said I'd had a dream about giving up Pepsi Max, and now I... This is how much I loved Pepsi Max. I could drink probably four liters of Pepsi Max a day. That is a lot of Pepsi Max. And I said that I was gonna uh, stop drinking Pepsi Max. That was my plan. We lasted until Tuesday when I think maybe some form of hurting of me was on the cards in my household. Because it turns out that Pepsi Max has some chemicals in it that if you suddenly stop drinking, 
going to make you a bit grumpy uh, than usual. And so I've had to go to a slightly different plan where I am now cutting down. But God has spoken to me about this so many times about how much of this stuff that I drink. And I need to shake that off and, and stop drinking it completely because it's not that it's particularly bad for me. I don't think, well, maybe it is. But I do need to, to cut it down. And this is by way of telling Pepsi that their share price is going to drop because their sales are dropping as I stop buying it. Um, but God has been patient with me there. God has been patient with me in other areas. There are going to be people here this morning where God has told you you need to either stop doing something or start doing something. If God is patient with us, how much more patient should we be with the people around us? Something that I think we all need to learn. Love does not remember wrongs. Oh, this is a big one, isn't it? Love does not remember wrongs. You see, when you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, all the things that you've done that are wrong, that have damaged your relationship with God, are, are covered. Jesus has paid the price. God won't remember them. You know, there's a bit more to it than that. You need to repent and, and you know, accept him into your life. But if God doesn't remember our wrongs, if God doesn't punish us for our wrongs, how much more do we need to remember, how much more do we need to forget the wrongs that people have done to us? You know, if, if I had a list of all the times I'd done something wrong or somebody had done something wrong to me, you know, there would be a long list. And if I was hanging on to that, that wouldn't do me any good. Now, I just want you to hear that I'm not saying there isn't consequence for doing wrongs. You know, if you break the law, then you deserve to get the, the earthly punishment. You know, if, if you speed and you get caught and, there are, and you get points, you probably deserve that. If you go and rob the local bank, get caught and, you know, you go to prison, then you deserve that punishment. But it, is it our place to keep remembering that and holding that against people time and time again if they've been punished? We need, to, we need to not keep that record. We need to be trusting. Yes, there are, you know, I understand that that's, you know, pretty fluffy and, and simple. But I think that love doesn't remember wrongs because otherwise, you know, when you're arguing, you know, one of, I, my wife never does this to me, but one of the things I've heard that happen in some relationships is that you'll be having an argument and then one of the parties will say, well, 10 years ago, you didn't take the bin out. And like, you know, where's that come from? That isn't helpful to remember those wrongs. It's gonna eat you up more than it eats the other person up. We need to realize that if we're gonna build a foundation of love, if we're gonna have love in our relationships, we're gonna have love in our friendships, and we need to stop remembering the wrongs of the past. And I, do you know what? I, I, that's a word for me as much as it is for anybody else, because there are times when, you know, maybe, you know, somebody will wanna do something, and I'll be like, well, last time it didn't work out so well, and, and so we need to get past that. Love always protects. Now this is an interesting, this is, you know, I think where we have, again, obligated some of our responsibilities. Because, you know, we sense the word as protectors. Well, I'm going to protect you from that fire, or if, if somebody comes running in and tries to attack you, then I'm going to protect you. I think that love always protects actually means something different as well. Because sometimes we need to protect our loved ones, our friends from themselves. And that may mean challenging things that we see in their life that are wrong. Because that is about protecting, isn't it? If I, if I see one of my friends, you know, is about to, to jump off a cliff and is, you know, he thinks he can fly, then, you know, well, here's the best one, right? Is Joshua in the room? No, he's not. Okay, I'll get away with this. Joshua, went, Joshua's my, my eldest, he's now 13, but you know, like all good parents, I sat him down in front of Toy Story at some point in his life, and he watched the movie Toy Story. And, uh, 
and I love Joshua with all my heart. And uh, he suddenly appeared one day with a set of wings, called himself Buzz, after Buzz Lightyear, and announced that he was going to fly, and started heading towards his bedroom, which is on the third floor of our house, with a V-Lux window. And I just had visions of him standing on top of the roof and letting go, and saying, I can fly. Now, love protects Joshua from himself there, doesn't it? He's going to hurt himself. Sometimes love protecting means challenging. You know, there are a lot of things happening in the world at the moment where we need to demonstrate Christian love by trying to protect people. Protect them from themselves. Protect them from uh, making those bad decisions. We can't stop them sometimes, but we need to, we need to take protection to a, a different level. Love trusts. If you're thinking about going into a relationship with somebody, if you're single here today and you've been maybe starting to date somebody, do you trust that person? Because if you don't, I wouldn't carry on dating them. We need to trust. Love trusts. You know, trust is a, is a, is a, is a funny thing really, isn't it? It takes years to build up and seconds to waste. And that's kind of goes back to we don't remember wrongs. But love trusts. And we need to be prepared to trust people. We need to be prepared that we are going to get hurt occasionally. We need to have faith in people. You know, it, it's, it's interesting when we think about how God has chosen to use the church. He's trusted human beings to go out and spread the good news, inspired by the Holy Spirit living inside them. But he's trusting you and me. He's it's scary that you trust me because, you know, I'm not perfect, as I've already said. I'm, I can, I'm a fool and I, I make mistakes. And if God can trust me, then we need to trust. <coughs> if you can't trust somebody, on the, then you need to explore why that is. If you are an untrustworthy person, you need to set about restoring that. Love hopes and perseveres. I put these two together, they go hand in hand. Boy, just as I've used my uh, uh, love is patient up before I get out of bed, I think by the time I've made Reese breakfast, she's practicing love perseveres. You know, we need to persevere in this world. God didn't just wash his hands of it all and say, I've had enough of this lot, I'm going to, you know, they, they can't get anything right, Adam's drunk Pepsi Max again, this person keeps doing this thing, they're watching this thing on the telly and it's not right and I've told them. He perseveres with us. We need to persevere in love. We need to persevere in love for our communities, for our country, for the world. If lo lo this foundation of love is going to have to be built on perseverance. Because it's too easy to give up. You know, it may not look like it, but I need to be on a diet. And sometimes I have to persevere. It, sometimes it is easy to give up. Sometimes, you know, I know that when I go through into the canteen afterwards, there is going to be some food. There is going to be some great food. Is Auntie Rose in the room? Is she in the room? She's getting the food ready. Please let there be the yellow rice that she does because I love it. And I will barge any of you out. No, sorry, that's not nothing. <laughs> to get there. But we need to persevere. You know, how easy is it for us to say, well, they, I've messed up or they've messed up and we're going to give up on that again? 
We need to persevere. Without perseverance, we wouldn't have light bulbs. We wouldn't have half the things, or probably all the things that we have in this world. If I gave up whenever, you know, we just need to persevere. As Graham and Sharon have probably experienced, or maybe not, who knows? Marriage requires perseverance. We have to persevere in not remembering the wrongs. We have to persevere in being patient. We have to persevere in trust. In some marriages, there needs to be some hope. We need to persevere in hope that things are going to get better. In some relationships, we need to hope that things are going to get better. You know, we just... I think... We, in a world now, it's too easy to give up. It's too easy to just stop and say, I'm not going to do that, I can't be bothered, it's too hard. We need to persevere. You see, I want to give you one more example of an act of love. An act of love that changed my life that I know has changed the life of many people here in this hall this morning. And as I said earlier, this is, there is an act in history that happened that can change your life forever. John 3, 16 to 17 says the following. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's just think on that. That's how much God loved you. And there we are, tripping over the thing. God loved you so much. He loved David, he loved Damien, he loved Sophie, he loved Maureen, he loved James, he loved every one of you, he knows every one of you individually, and so much he loves you that he sent his one and only son to die for you. So that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so perhaps this is the ultimate definition of what love is, it is sacrifice. It is laying yourself down for somebody else, be it a, a wife, a husband, a friend. It is sacrifice. God loved us so much that he was prepared to do that. Jesus didn't deserve to die on the cross. He'd done nothing wrong. Only perfect man in history. Only perfect person in history. But God loves us, wants that love with us, to, 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 to have us in an eternal relationship with him, that he sent his only son to die for us. That realisation of what that meant to me changed my life forever. And it didn't change it for the worse, it changed it for the better. That's probably really bad grammar. But it did. It changed my life. You see, before that I was selfish. I was self-centred. I was greedy. I was arrogant. I was in it for whatever was for me. But then when I realised that there was somebody that loved me so much that they would send their son to die for me. And when I really sat down and thought about what that meant. And... You know, I don't even think now that I'm a father that I can really grasp what that means. It changed my life forever. Because God loved so much. Because he loves us so much. And I'm coming in to, to, to finish now. Are we willing to reclaim what the, the, the true meaning of love. The Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. Written at a time when probably the connotations behind that weren't as pure as we'd like. But 
But this is what this world needs. It needs a love revolution. It doesn't need a love revolution that's, that's the cheap love that we see now on the telly, that we see now in, in, in the world. It needs a revolution of biblical love, Amen. of what it means to love somebody as a Christian, what it means to love the world in the sense of caring about the world as a Christian. We need to, we need as a church, and I, I, I love being part of Hope Church, kind of hand, he's one of the pastors that that's good, that I, that I love being part of Hope Church, because I see love in action in Hope Church day after day after day. But we need, we need more people to know about the love of God. We need to know more people. We need to know the church, the Western church, the whole church needs to know more that the world, that, that, that God loves them than the things that we don't like. Because I think that that's what we're remembered for at the moment. We don't like this. We don't like that. We don't like swearing on telly. We don't da-da-da-da-da, you know, blah, blah, blah. We don't like all of those things. And yet the very foundation of what we are built on is love. Because God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. We need to introduce people to God. We need to introduce people to what it means to, to know God, to love God, and to live out of the overflow of his love. God is love. Amen. And that's where we need to get to. You know, we sang a song, and I was trying to scribble the lyrics down earlier. Uh, is it going to be too technical to get the overwhelming love of song, uh, the verse up? Because I want us just to, to look at these words this morning. Because I think if we, if we undertake this love revolution, if we, if we reclaim that word love, you know, because that... I want to warn us, church, that if we don't reclaim the word love, it's going to get dumbed down so much. It's going to mean so little. You know, it'll be gone. You know, history is littered with words that meant some one thing and now mean something completely different. We need to fight for this word love. We need to, we need to elevate the word love back up. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I don't deserve God's love. But he loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me. You can't earn your way into heaven. You can never be good enough. But you don't need to worry about that because God loves you so much. We need to change. Yes, we need to repent. But don't sit there fretting, thinking, well, how can I earn my way into heaven? Because it's never going to work. We need to accept the fact that he has come looking for us. Leaves the 99, comes looking for the one. And right now, this morning, as we finish, as I finish the sermon this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, if you're not, if you've not experienced God's love in your life, if you're not living out of the overflow of a relationship with God, then can I challenge you right now to stop and to think? You see, what will keep Graham and Sharon safe? Is true biblical love. They love God with all of their heart. And they love each other. That's what will help. That's what will see them through. Because if it doesn't, because if we don't have that love, then when the tough times come, and they do, we'll just get blown off course. We need to reclaim The word love. We need a biblical love revolution. We're going to um, go into a song in a minute, I think. And uh, but I want to give an opportunity at the end of the service for those of you maybe that 
don't know God's love, who haven't entered into that relationship, then I'd encourage you, there'll be a prayer ministry team over here on my right, your left, after we've sung this next song, then I would encourage you to come forward and to talk to those guys, they will pray with you. And maybe you are a Christ follower, maybe you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour this morning, but maybe you need some help in some of those areas of love. Can I encourage you this morning to come forward and to receive prayer? I, I, I've been thinking about this message all week. You see, I could have just spoken solely about marriage this morning. But marriage is part of a journey. A journey we're all on here. There is only two definite points in our life you can try and disagree with me if you want but you were born and we will die they're the only two certainties in our life in the sense of things that we can nail down are definitely going to happen marriage is part of, of Graham and Sharon's journey but all of us can benefit from a good long look at biblical love. We're going to worship and I'm sure what song we sing in there. Anchor. We're going to sing a song called Anchor which is great and now I'm tripping over other things that are there to catch me. Um, and then I want to encourage you to come up and to receive prayer if you would like to. So we're going to worship and then I'll hand back to David who will uh, just bring the service to a close.